very good. So we were talking about Stokes theorem. We're going to go over surface integrals. Surface integrals. Perfect. A parametric surface can be defined this way. Can be defined as R of U and V, which is equal to, for example, X of UV, X is a function of UV, Y is a function of UV, and also your Z as a function of UV. So we're introducing two parameters like U and V. Note that U and V, both of them, belong to the domain as well. So when you're talking about the surface integral, a function f over surface s, the surface integral of a function like f over surface s is defined as a double integral of f of x, y, and z ds over surface s, which eventually can be rewritten as the double integral over region d of f of We're substituting all of these components in function f, so f of R, U, and V, and then multiplied by the magnitude R, U, cross R, V, and then D, A. So how did we define R, U, and R, V? R, U is equal to partial derivative of X with respect to U, partial derivative of y with respect to u, and partial derivative of z with respect to u. Then rv is equal to the vector, partial derivative of x, with respect to v, partial derivative of y with respect to v, and partial derivative of z with respect to v. So you are actually finding the cross product and the magnitude. Very good. Let's take a look at one example here. Suppose I ask you, compute the surface integral, the integral over a surface. Surface integral given to you as the double integral of x squared ds over surface S, where S is the unit sphere. S is your unit sphere. Very good. So first of all, we're going to write the unit sphere in parametric form. So we can convert everything into U and V, and then follow the nice formula given to us. Recall that from what you learned before, we can write down x as rho sine phi cosine theta. Y can be written as rho sine phi sine theta. And z can be written as rho cosine phi. Well, you are working with a unit sphere. What's the meaning of that? It means that this rho is nothing but one. So since you have unit sphere, rho is one. So wherever you see rho, you're going to use one. It means that you can just get rid of rho here. Well, obviously your phi 
is bounded between zero and pi, and theta is going to be bounded between zero and two pi. Perfect. So the parametric representation, parametric representation of the unit sphere is going to be R of, instead of U and V, we're going to use just phi and theta. Phi and theta, which is equal to, well, my X is sine phi cosine theta, sine phi cosine theta. My Y is sine phi sine theta, and my Z is just cosine phi. So I converted my S into parametric form. Now I need to compute each one of these, do the cross multiplication, and find the magnitude. So let's do that. Here we have our phi, which is partial derivative of x with respect to phi, which is cosine phi, cosine theta, partial derivative of y with respect to phi, cosine phi, and sine theta. And finally, the partial derivative of z with respect to phi is negative sine phi. Then r theta, taking the partial derivative with respect to theta, this is going to be negative sine phi, sine theta, and this guy is going to be sine phi, cosine theta, and this guy doesn't have any theta in it. It means that the partial derivative is zero. Very good. So let us compute the cross multiplication here. Let me move it a little bit up and cross multiplication. R phi cross R theta is going to be, you have I, J, and K. We're going to list these two. Vector components, cosine phi, cosine theta, cosine phi, sine theta, and negative sine phi. On the last row, you have negative sine phi, sine theta, then you have sine phi, cosine theta, and you have a zero. I will just do the computation as we did before. Very good. Just want to make sure we have enough space. This is equal to i. And here we have zero plus, we get sine squared phi cosine theta. minus j, and this is going to be zero. And here you have minus sine squared phi, so you get a plus sine squared phi, sine theta. And finally, you have a k. Let me write down k here. And here, if you multiply these two, you get sine phi, cosine phi, and then you have cosine squared theta plus, if you multiply these two, you get sine phi, cosine phi, and sine squared theta. Very good. Can we simplify this more? Yes. We can just, between these two, factor out sine phi and cosine phi and sine squared plus cosine squared is just one. But we can simplify this guy a little bit more. So let me just write this as sine phi cosine phi, and then note that I just factor these two out. The sum is just one. So this is going to be what you have. 
left here plus k sine phi cosine phi. Now we can find the magnitude. Magnitude is going to be equal to, let me write it here, magnitude r phi, r theta is equal to square root of the very first component to the second power plus the second component to the second power plus the third component to the second power. So we get sine to the fourth phi cosine squared theta plus sine to the fourth phi sine squared theta plus sine squared phi cosine squared phi. Very good. So here you can factor out sine to the fourth and you end up with cosine squared plus sine squared. So here you have sine to the fourth phi. Then between these two, you can factor out uh, sine squared phi and you end up with sine squared phi plus cosine squared phi. And if you simplify this, your final answer is going to be sine phi. So the magnitude is just sine phi. You can follow the formula. The double integral of x squared ds over s can be written as the double integral of f of r of mu and v. So wherever we see the components for our function f, we're going to do the substitution. So in this case, it's going to be x squared, am I right? So for x, we're going to use sine phi cosine theta to get sine squared phi cosine squared theta times the magnitude, which is sine phi, and then dA. dA, which gives us d phi, and then d theta, for example. So here you have your phi between 0 and pi, and theta 0 to 2 pi. Well, as you can see, there is no connection between these functions, and you have constant bounds so you can separate these. This guy can be written as the integral 0 to 2 pi and here you have cosine squared theta d theta times integral 0 to pi sine squared phi then we have sine phi d phi perfect. We can break this guy down as you remember from your pre-calculus. We can write this as integral 0 to 2 pi and cosine squared can be written as 1 plus cosine 2 theta divided by 2 d theta and this guy, well, here you can write sine squared phi as 1 minus cosine squared and use u sub integral 0 to pi 1 minus cosine squared phi times sine phi d phi. Perfect. Then you can simplify the whole thing and eventually for this guy again, use u sub, don't forget to do that. And let me see if we have enough space to write this down. This is going to be theta plus a half sine of two theta divided by two, zero to two pi. And for this guy, if you use u sub, get one minus u squared, and here you have your du. So here you end up with negative cosine phi plus a third cosine to the third of phi, and then it's bounded between zero to pi. So if you simplify the whole thing, your final answer is four pi over three. 